in 2010, if you look at the increase in income from 2009 to 2010, 93 percent of that increase went to the top one percent. Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a yeah, product kind of, of an economic but. system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. As the poor cotton farmers of East Texas and the South searched for a way out of their poverty, they identified the source of their conditions as the railroads and the East Coast banks. The farmers began to develop a system of farming co-ops and banking mechanisms independent of these powerful institutions. While creating the new systems, the populists advocated for structural changes to the political system. They realized that neither two political parties, Republicans in the North and Democrats in the South, served them. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red, as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identified with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Dalk and I host this series of half-hour weekly cable programs. Today our guest is Marty Hartlandsberg. Uh, Marty is an economics professor and director of the political economy program at Lewis and Clark College here in Portland. His areas of teaching and research include political economy, economic development, international economics, and the political economy of East Asia. He's the author of several books published by Monthly Review Press on economic development and class struggles in China, South Korea, as well as numerous articles. <laughs> right, great. Thank you for being here. You, oh. you were here once before, probably I was. a year it's, ago. I would it's guess. a pleasure to be back. Great, good. Yeah, so today we want to talk about inequality. And, and um, uh, since the Occupy movement, mm -hmm. uh, there's been a much, much greater focus on inequality. Of course, inequality's been around for a very long right. time. But can you just outline for us some of the current trends? Sure. Where is inequality going? Yeah, and I think you're right to, to highlight the role of the Occupy movement with its, where the 99% really began to get people to understand that inequality is a political issue. Um, but you're also right that inequality had been growing for some time. Um, I think what happened generally is that the media and most economists either tried to ignore it or if they were forced to confront the growing inequality, they would say things like, well, it's not very important, or it's because of technology, or it's because of a mismatch of, of skills with, with job openings. And so the, the, the result was always to sort of say, there's not a systemic problem, and individuals just need to adjust or, or, or make the best of it. And what the Occupy movement did with its slogan is to say, no, no, th this is a, p a political issue, that there are policies which have caused inequality and it's not something that's just the result of, of forces that we, we can't really control. And just to sort of highlight some of these trends without going into to too much, um, too, many, too many numbers, um, one that, that really captures, I think, things is in, in 2010, if you look at the increase in income from 2009 to 2010, 93 percent of that increase went to the top 1 percent of Americans. Hmm. So only 7% of all the increased income was divided up among the bottom 99%. And of course, it wasn't divided up equally there. Okay. Um, so let, let me, because that, that's, that's a very important to just in that one year. Yes. So repeat that for us. Okay. The increase in income from 2009 to 2010. This is the aggregate income of total all Total income Americans. of the United States. Okay. 
93% of that went to the top 1%. Okay. And in fact, the top 1%, the top one-tenth of 1% increased their income by $4.2 million over that year, the top 1% by 105000 and the bottom 99% on average increased by $80. Wow. And of course, for most people, there was actually a decline. And, and this, this process has been getting worse and worse. For example, in the Clinton area expansion, only 45% of the increase in income went to the top 1%. In the Bush recovery, it was 65%. Now it's you know, 93%. Uh, in a longer term period, the top uh, from 1979 to 2007, the top 1% has captured 60% of all the increase in income and 90% of all the increase in capital gains. So when we think about interest income, dividends, um, non-corporate business profits, 90% of that goes just has gone, all of that, to just the top 1%. Mm -hmm. So I think the key is um, that since 1979, inequality has, has been growing slowly and, and substantially. Um, and what's important is not just that everybody's getting richer, but the people at the top are getting richer at a faster rate. It's that the top 1%, 5 maybe even 15% have gone better, but 60 75% of the people have actually lost ground. They, they command fewer resources now um, than they did before. Yeah. So not, not only is the middle, currently, not only is the middle class shrinking, but the resources that the middle class have is shrinking as well. Right. right. Yep. So, so this, this inequality is a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think going back to, to, to how we started, um, it's not accidental. And, um, and very briefly, I think at the end of World War II, you had a situation where U.S. corporations were really dominating the world for all sorts of historical reasons. And as workers and social movements struggled to get more of a share of that, U.S. companies were sort of willing to, to give them some things. And so we had you know, unions, we had wage increases tied to productivity, we had social programs. But by the end of the 60s into the 70s, Europe and Japan had been rebuilt. U.S. companies were feeling pressured. Um, uh, workers were demanding uh, and social movements demanding more. And so the, the elite began to feel their profits going down, their wealth going down, and they needed and they decided to act. And so their actions were things like break unions, change labor laws, roll back social programs, promote globalization, even the financialization of the economy. All of these kinds of things have promoted inequality. And an important thing to sort of realize is that early on when this was happening, in say the 70s, 80s, even into the early 90s, the system wasn't functioning that well. Profits were not that high, but the suppression of wages and people's programs created inequality that meant that these top 1%, top 5% were, were doing better than they had before. With all the borrowing, the mid-90s to the present, all this debt expansion, meant that the profits started to soar and the very top's gains just exploded. But the same institutions, the destruction of the labor movement, the lab bad labor laws, globalization, finance, meant that people at the bottom were, did not have a changed position. Mm -hmm. So that there are two different ways people often talk about inequality. There's profits and wages, and then there's inequality in, in income. And profits have grown at the expense of wages, but the bigger difference has been this explosion of inequality because of, particularly in finance and other places, some of these wealthy people are just generating a tremendous am amount of income. So I guess the point to say is that the Occupy movement was very, very important in saying, look, this is a, you know, this is a process that has a political drive, and, the, and as a consequence, it's not something that will reverse itself um, or that you know markets will take care of it, or individuals can respond. This is a political project. Okay. Yeah. And and what? How how do we get people to understand that it's a political process? Because it seems like mm -hmm. most people think that it's kind of organic. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. Yeah. That. And of course, a lot of people think that those folks at the very top, the top one tenth of one percent, mm -hmm. the one percent, mm -hmm. the top ten percent, mm -hmm. all deserve that. Yeah. How, how do we get beyond that? 
Well, I think the Occupy movement has helped by calling attention to this. I think people's needs at some point, you know, you say, I don't really care what the justifications are. I'm losing my house. I'm losing my job. But there's also some good information that can sort of put the lie to some of the common explanations. For example, people say, well, it's technology. Um, but interestingly, from 2000 to 2010, the average real income adjusted for inflation of working people, whether they had a high school, whether they never went to high school, whether they completed high school, whether they had some college, whether they completed college, or whether they had a master's degree, all categories suffered a decline in earnings. The only categories that didn't, on average, were PhDs, law degrees, and MBAs. So if it's technology, you would think more education people would be getting. All these people mm -hmm. in all these categories are losing money. The other thing that I think puts the lie to the fact that it's a matter of just us getting more education is the Bureau of Labor Statistics does a study where they project out over the next 20 years what will be the jobs that will employ the most people in the economy. And they listed the top 30, and I brought along this list just to highlight a few things, and then I'll tell you why I'm doing that. Okay. So these are the 30 jobs that are projected to have the greatest number of workers. So number one, are registered nurses, retail salespersons, home health aides, personal care aides, office clerks, combined food preparation and serving workers, customer service, heavy tractor trailer truck drivers, laborers and freight stock and material movers. If I go down that list of 30, 10 of those occupations, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, do not require a high school diploma. 14 require only a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. Only four require a college degree or more. So if the system isn't generating jobs mm -hmm. that require higher skills and, and pay, it really doesn't matter what people do. We could have everybody going to get a college degree, yes. learning all these things, but the system isn't interested in hiring people because they've created jobs that, that don't yeah. have that, that, or if that they structure. Do, or if they do hire those people that have the more education, mm -hmm. they're still going to be retail clerks. That's right. And in, or exactly. And, right. and, and in the and, service industry. That's right. right. And so I think what's, what the consequence of that is that you pose the question, how do we get people to see this is systemic? And, you know, I think that is a big challenge, although I think the occupying movements putting this inequality on the agenda as a political issue starts to break through these excuses. And I guess that's, you know, the, the, the challenge uh, of, yeah. of, of organizing. Um, I think that one of the things that the Occupy movement has helped to do is get people to, you know, right now I think there's a strong understanding with the financial speculation and illegalities and this austerity drive that people realize that there are people at the top who've made a lot of money, and these social programs are being cut, their taxes are being cut, and so there's a crisis. And I think it has produced a demand for, um, you know, going after the people who've been engaged in all this financial chicanery, but also taxing the wealthy to provide services for students. Uh, you know, student debt mm -hmm. is now greater than all credit card debt. Yeah. Right? Um, so students are, are struggling, people are losing their homes, health care is an issue, education is an issue. So there's been this movement that I think um, Occupy has helped to create that says, look, we need to personalize what's happening, that this is a political project of the 1%. They've made a lot. The taxes are low. We're being squeezed here. We need to do something. Um, and I think that's, that's won a lot of people over. Um, one of the problems is that it's also tended to present to people a picture of the situation we're in as one that could be solved without really dealing with capitalism. Mm -hmm. That we can correct it. You know, if we tax more, if we punish the wrongdoers, if we channel money into social programs, then we can ameliorate these problems. And I think one of the ways you can immediately see that this is not so easy is to go back to these jobs that I listed. You know, if these yeah. are, are low-paying mm -hmm. jobs, mm -hmm. um, people's ability to have a decent standard of living is gone. If, if, if all the social services are, you know, even if they're there, you know, what, what can we do? And, and so I think in that sense, the kind of focus on democracy, which is a very important one to take back our democracy, the fact is that our democratic structure as it is now doesn't allow us to vote on who owns things, uh, where we decide where they're produced, the environmental or human consequences of how they're produced, and, and who gets money. 
uh, what the wages are and what the actual structure of work is. So that this notion of inequality is a very powerful one. But if we stand on the outside of it and just say we need to tax and channel the money into social programs, which, which is important, mm -hmm. in and of itself, it leaves the system sort of untouched. So we need, we need to have a larger analysis than just you know, supporting a particular bill in Congress that will yes. you know, maybe get us in the right direction, but we need to have That's a larger right. picture. That's right. Okay. And, and I think you know, one, of the, one of the reasons that I think reinforces that is that in demanding that money goes to social programs like you know, support education or support mass transit, or support health care. Part of the problem is that some of those social services are not ideal. Uh, yeah. And right. we don't want to be put in the position of, of defending um, programs, as important as they are, that aren't ideal. And in many cases, they're, they're not ideal because we've had past governments put in positions of authority, people who don't believe in them, mm -hmm. um, and, and so weaken them. So, it's not only just a matter of saying we can't just put in a bill to correct this, although, you know, correcting our tax system is important, defending our social programs is important, but I think if we just stick at that level, it, it's kind of a losing battle for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, what other points did you want to make today? Well, I, I think to, to go beyond that one is to say, you know, how do we go beyond in a way? And I think that for me, a lot of the demands that have come out of the Occupy movement on, on housing, on, on transit, on education, other things, really revolve around the public sector. And I think what's really critical is that the Occupy movement and the public sector union movement find each other. And it's not just because these both groups of people, there's overlap, of course, public mm -hmm. sector workers are part of the Occupy movement, but it's because Putting them together is a way, I think, to begin to turn the attention more deeper into the system and begin a process of, of change. Um, for example, um, if, one, if, if the Occupy movement, which has generated groups of people who care about public transportation, has generated people who care about education, health care, the public sector workers to this point are under attack. So take teachers. You know, there's tremendous cuts going with teachers. There's tremendous uh, demands of teachers to teach to tests. You know, firing of teachers. But whenever time, you know, but but people are, are often hostile to public sector workers, and they mm -hmm. say you've got better pensions, you've got better wages, and somehow they think if they vote against the unionized public sector workers, they're they're going to be better off, which I think is a very serious mistake. And public sector workers then try and defend themselves, and it, and it goes yeah. nowhere for them. Course, that's all. That's all part of who gets to define what the conversation is about. Exactly. Right. So it seems to me that if the Occupy movement, people who care, uh, who are against militarism, who are for the environment, who are against discrimination, could sit down with the progressive teachers and say, what would a progressive curriculum look like at our schools? How would we shape one? How would we support you in promoting one? And those progressive teachers then talk to other teachers. And the teachers' movement, the union movement, begins to see, well, you know, if when we bargain and when we think about things, we do so representing the community and have community support, then we have a process where people can start to say, you know why it's good to have a public school system? Because mm -hmm. it's an education system that will empower young people to be full participants in the society and to do good things. What would that mean? So it doesn't become just defending an existing system, but it becomes a process of people demanding a system. But the workers who are actually engaging in educating our children and ourselves mm -hmm. become part of that. The same with mass transit. It's not just a matter to say we need better transportation system, but if bus riders and bus drivers got together and said, what kind of buses should we have? What kind of routes should we have? What kind of fares should we have? Then we begin a process of rethinking our city, our transportation, and, and I think what becomes important then is for the public sector workers, they have to begin to say when we bargain, we're bargaining for a community mm -hmm. as well as ourselves. We become the defenders of the community. And the community, as it integrates and plays a role in those services, you know, is helping to sort of shape this in line with the public sector workers. And I think once we begin to think about remaking the public sector, it becomes easy to see why we need different taxes. Mm -hmm. It becomes easy to see why controlling production is what's absolutely necessary if we're going to have stable communities. 
and hopefully that can begin to spread to the private sector as well. And then we begin to move not just into trying to mend the problems caused by the system, but to really rethink our jobs, our communities, our services. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you see any of this uh, coming together uh, in this manner? Any of these kind of conversations taking place? Um, I see in some areas. Um, one of the things that gives me hope is in some areas through the Occupy movement, there are actually constituencies of people who care about these issues. So at one point, there was a period where people talked about social movement unionism, where unions should think of themselves as defenders of the broader working class, which is important. Mm -hmm. But there really wasn't a partner of the community to say, well, that's general. Let's mm -hmm. talk about transportation. Let's talk about education. And so I think the Occupy movement and the growing interest in cities and communities is producing, um, uh, producing those groups of people who care about those things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the public sector unions have to take more account of that and begin to look for ways of connecting. So I see the public sector under heavy attack and interested and open to trying to figure out what to do. I see the Occupy movement have given birth to a number of different organizations who care about the community, who care about the city, who care about the public services. To this point, I don't think the Occupy movement has, has embraced labor, although there are workers in the Occupy movement, mm -hmm. and the public sector unions haven't really embraced the notion that they have to also be accountable and should be accountable to the community in ways of thinking about how those services are organized. In that sense, it's a transformation of, of both groups. Um, I think some of those conversations are taking place. Um, it's a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a big um, challenge. And there's no guarantee. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, starting with that inequality question, um, we're not going to change the consequences. Of, we're not going to change the mechanisms that are generating inequality strictly by changing taxes. Mm -hmm. We try and raise taxes. What do wealthy people do? They move their assets. Right. right? Uh -huh. yeah. If we don't have control over production, if we don't define the way jobs are created, it just gets recreated. So how do we get people to move into an understanding that what happens in production is important, that unions are important, mm -hmm. and the connections are important? Okay. Yeah. Do you see a role for uh, private sector unions in this? Very much so. I mean, um, rebuilding them is going to be absolutely uh, it, critical. It, yeah. uh, the reason I start with the public sector is because still that's the sector that's the most heavily unionized. Mm -hmm. But also I think that the focus that's come on the city which has been a very big part of the Occupy movement, lends itself to thinking about the public sector unions because it's the roads, it's the bridges, it's the transportation, it's the health care, it's the education um, that's really captured people mm -hmm. and people's need for, for those programs. Um, and I think in the case of the public sector unions, the very nature of their activity puts them much more directly in touch with the community. Mm -hmm. Um, so whether you're talking about teachers, healthcare workers, social workers, you know, transportation people, the, the connections are much more organic. Mm -hmm. So I think for historical reasons, this is sort of the natural start. And if people begin to see that these things matter, then hopefully their understanding of why unions can be important. Hopefully unions come to understand, you know, one of the sad things about, say, going back to Wisconsin, thinking about Wisconsin, the big struggle mm -hmm. that was there to, to try and recall the, the governor who's, uh, who's wrecked the, the economy yeah. and people's lives uh -huh. there, is that the polling showed that although union workers voted heavily for recall, it, only about 50% of their partners did. Hmm. And that a large percentage of people thought unions were out only for themselves, and as people are worse off, rather than say, I'm glad some people are holding on to something, it's like, yeah. you know, we, you've got more than us and why should you? And so the governor went around actually saying, you don't have any pensions, why should you pay taxes to have pensions for public sector uh -huh. workers? It's a, you know, it's a downward spiral. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I think the, the challenge for even private sector unions is to reconceptualize who they are mm -hmm. um, and what they're fighting for. And so in the U.S. we had the auto workers who for many years said, well, we can get good health care, why should we support public health care? Yeah. Right? right. Or, you know, we're going to keep on driving instead of mass transit. So I think if we can begin this process, then I think the goal is, the strategy has to be ultimately to open it up to, to, to support changes for the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we're just about out of time. So okay. uh, unfortunately <laughs> already, uh, you're going to be back next week for a, a, a second 
episode, and we're going to talk about free trade. Yep, okay. it's certainly a related topic. Uh, ab absolutely right. Yeah. So thank you for being oh, here today. My pleasure. Okay. Great. Good. So we've been talking with Marty Hart Landsberg, who's an economics professor at Lewis and Clark College here in Portland. Never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. Want to watch an episode again? Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Cl click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. We're also available on Blip TV. Search for Populist Dialogues. Subscriptions are available there as well. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more, visit our web, national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. We want to thank our crew today for being here. Wouldn't be on the air without them. Roger Bates, Don Baham, and Richard Hatch. And thanks to the audience. We hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye. Corporations are people. Money is speech. The U.S. Supreme Court for more than the past century has ruled that corporations have constitutional rights as if they were flesh and blood people like you and I. And since 1976 have repeatedly ruled that for political purposes money is speech. In January of 2010 they ruled in Citizens United versus the FEC that corporations can spend corporate funds directly on so-called independent campaigns and the floodgates were opened. We want our democracy back. We can take our democracy back from the plutocrats and the corporations by amending the U.S. Constitution to make clear that corporations are not people and that money is not speech. Join us now in this new democracy movement and support amending the Constitution. Learn more at movetomend.org or here in Portland, Oregon at movetomendpdx.org. And join the democracy movement with the Alliance for Democracy in Portland, afd-pdx.org, and nationally at thealliancefordemocracy.org. All right, let's get this done.